This story is a vivid and tragic example of how our trust and kindness towards others can turn into a real nightmare for us. 15-year-old Stephanie and her family showed compassion and hospitality to a person they barely knew. They had no idea that behind the mask of a calm and decent man lurked a dangerous criminal with a dark past. This carelessness cost the young girl her life and her loved ones, unspeakable grief and emotional suffering. What happened to Stephanie makes us wonder whether it is worth opening our hearts and trusting those we do not know thoroughly. Of course, one cannot live in constant suspicion and see a potential criminal in everyone. But blindly believing everyone is dangerous and irresponsible, especially when it comes to the safety of our children and loved ones. The roots of this sad event go back to the distant year 2002. The small German town of Ludenscheid became Stephanie's home, where she spent the lion's share of her short life. The girl grew up in a loving family along with her older brother, with whom she had remarkably close and trusting relationships. But one summer, their carefree childhood was abruptly cut short. Sylvia, Stephanie's mother, who had recently divorced the father of her children, decided to radically change her life and move to sunny Spain in search of new experiences and opportunities. For her new home, Sylvia chose the picturesque island of Mallorca, part of the Balearic Islands. The woman was confident that this was the perfect place to start life from scratch and leave all the painful memories behind. Together with her children, she settled in the charming area of El Arenal, where warm and sunny weather reigned all year round. Stephanie enthusiastically embraced this idea, because the change of scenery promised her new acquaintances, adventures, and vivid impressions. But she had no idea what a fatal role her mother's new lover, a man named Peter, whom she had met shortly before the move, would play in her fate. Initially, Sylvia went to Mallorca alone, leaving the children in Germany under the care of their grandparents. She needed time to find suitable housing and prepare everything necessary for a full-fledged move for the summer months. The woman was in a hurry to settle all matters before the end of the school year and the start of the long-awaited vacation for the children. Sylvia even managed to find a temporary job as a manager in a five-star hotel, where she got a part-time job during the day. Meanwhile, Stephanie and her brother were eagerly waiting for the opportunity to finally join their mother on the Paradise Island. And so, on the very first day of the summer holidays, they were already in Mallorca, where Sylvia planned to stay until September. The woman rented a spacious two-story apartment, where she settled with Peter and the children. For young Stephanie, this became a real adventure and the beginning of a new stage. She immersed herself in the vibrant life of Mallorca, especially attracted by the island's nightlife, which fully corresponded to the age and character of the curious girl. Stephanie adored parties and quickly found company among the local youth. She often stayed out late into the night and sometimes could even not come home for several days in a row. Most often, Stephanie could be found in bars and clubs surrounded by other girls and sometimes boys. Of course, such behavior of her daughter greatly worried Sylvia, who more than once made scandals because of Stephanie's late returns from parties. Peter expressed particular dissatisfaction because the girl's disobedience frankly spoiled the vacation and mood of her mother, and therefore he had to constantly be in a state of stress, calming his beloved instead of enjoying the Paradise Island. The man repeatedly tried to shame the teenager and restore order so that everyone would be comfortable. However, Stephanie, who found herself in a completely new situation, simply torn between the desire to obey her mother and the temptation to continue having fun with her peers in Mallorca. Stephanie understood that she made her family worry, but she could not help herself. Despite her rebellious nature, Stephanie still managed to reach an understanding with Sylvia. Of course, this led to a temporary cooling of relations between them. For several days, Stephanie sulked at her family, but deep down she was aware of their concern and unwillingness to compromise. Her frivolous behavior really gave cause for concern. In the end, Stephanie pulled herself together and promised to mend her ways. It seemed that peace and harmony reigned in the family again. Of course, for young Stephanie, it was unbearably difficult to give up an active vacation with her friends. Sylvia, in turn, suspected how far her daughter's fascination with nightlife could go. However, Stephanie had a weighty argument. Very soon the holidays would end. She would return to Germany and go back to school. 
Stephanie planned to enter university after graduating and become a veterinarian, so she begged her mother to let her spend more time with her friends while she had the chance, and promised to be more careful and always come home on time, without breaking the established rules. It took several serious conversations before Sylvia understood and accepted her daughter's arguments. On July 31, 2002, Stephanie again asked for permission to go have fun with her friends. The prospect of a quick return to school became the decisive argument for Sylvia. Moreover, recently Stephanie's behavior had been quite adequate. So Stephanie went to another party, promising to return no later than midnight. The family decided not to wait for her and just went to bed, hoping that Stephanie would keep her word, as she had done recently after their serious conversation. But in the morning, coming out of the bedroom, Sylvia noticed her daughter's bag thrown on the floor in the hallway. The woman immediately suspected that Stephanie had returned late at night, drunk, carelessly threw her things and went to sleep in her room. Deciding to take the bag to her daughter and at the same time check if everything was all right with her, Sylvia went to the girl's room. But instead of seeing Stephanie in bed, she was surprised to find the room empty. It seemed that Peter had woken up earlier than his wife, but he had not seen Stephanie either. Then Sylvia woke up her son, but he also knew nothing about his sister's whereabouts. The family began to worry again, as they often did before. But, in the end, there was nothing unusual in such behavior for Stephanie. After all, before she and her mother reached an agreement about night walks and late returns, Stephanie often stayed overnight with friends or girlfriends after parties and could not appear at home for several days. Sylvia was sure that her daughter Stephanie was up to her old tricks again and was preparing to make a scene as soon as she appeared at home. However, the mother was not too worried, because such behavior was quite usual for the 15-year-old rebel. But the longer Stephanie did not make herself known, the stronger the anxiety and panic in Sylvia's soul became. In the end, after a week of solitary searches, the exhausted woman dared to turn to the police. All this time, she had been calling all of Stephanie's friends she knew, even visiting some of them at home, communicating with both the teenagers themselves and their parents. But no one could say where Stephanie had gone. She had not been seen for a long time. So, at the beginning of August, the despondent Sylvia came to the local police station, reporting that her daughter had not appeared at home for a whole week. Given such a long period of absence, law enforcement officers immediately started an investigation. They also talked to Stephanie's immediate circle and her family. They questioned the security guards of nightclubs, tourists and waiters who worked and rested in the establishments that Stephanie often visited with her friends. But none of the witnesses could answer where the young beauty had gone. The main obstacle was the time that had passed. During this week, a lot of events happened in the lives of the interviewees. New parties were held every day, so many details could have simply been erased from memory. In order to refresh memories and, possibly, get new leads from local residents, the police, together with Stephanie's relatives, posted leaflets with her photographs all over the city. In the end, this brought some clues, but they turned out to be futile. In the end, the Spanish law enforcement officers put forward their first version, which they considered quite probable. They suggested that Stephanie, being drunk, could have gone for a walk on the beach and just fallen asleep somewhere there. Given the long absence of any traces of Stephanie, the chances of finding her alive were melting before our eyes. All this time, Stephanie did not even try to contact her relatives. She did not use her cards, phones, or messengers, which was extremely atypical for a teenager of her age. The version about the kidnapping had to be discarded, because during this period no one ever contacted the family with a ransom demand. The Marine police and helicopters joined the search, combing the coast and waters in the hope of stumbling upon a body. Loved ones continued to hope that Stephanie could still be seen alive. Perhaps she had just lingered with some new acquaintances. But deep down, Everyone understood that the chances of her happy return were slim. There were no leads until the missing girl's mother started her own investigation. Sylvia had no particular choice of directions, so she decided to thoroughly search her daughter's room. The police had already conducted searches there in search of clues, but to no avail. However, the woman believed that she knew her child better than anyone, and therefore her chances of coming across something important were much higher. And it really worked. 
In Stephanie's diary, Sylvia managed to find a mention of a meeting with some young man named Marcus. The guy lived in Dusseldorf and, like Stephanie, came to Mallorca to spend the summer. As it turned out, the newly made friends met at one of the beach parties in Playa de Palma. This information was confirmed by several of Stephanie's friends. Later, continuing the search in the room of her 15-year-old daughter, Sylvia came across a camera with an inserted film. It contained several photographs taken shortly before Stephanie's disappearance. The woman decided to develop the photos in order to look at them more closely. Meanwhile, the detectives relentlessly continued the active search for the missing girl. They managed to find two girls who were in Stephanie's company on the night of her disappearance. Both turned out to be sisters and said that they had been walking around bars and clubs together all evening. All three of them had been hanging out in Mallorca since the first days of summer. The friends spent all their free time together, sunbathing on the beach during the day, and attending parties and various local establishments in the evening. It became known that on the same evening, the girls had fun on the beach together, and then went to a bar in El Arenal, where the sister's father worked. Finally, the law enforcement officers had something similar to a lead, which they decided to thoroughly investigate. Having recreated the events of that evening, they found out that at about 9 p.m., the friends appeared together in a nightclub. From the very beginning, Stephanie focused all her attention on the DJ. The 15-year-old beauty openly flirted with the young guy and at one point even left the party earlier than her friends, taking him with her. Later she returned, and all three of them continued to have fun. Around midnight, the sisters decided to go home, but Stephanie insisted that she wanted to wait until the end of the party. Her gaze kept getting stuck on the handsome DJ. At this time, Sylvia handed over the photographs found in her daughter's camera to the police for careful examination. In one of the pictures found in the girl's room, Stephanie was standing hugging some young man. With the help of the club staff, it was quickly possible to establish the identity of the stranger. It turned out to be the same 19-year-old DJ Marcus. The staff of the establishment was well acquainted with the missing girl. The detectives went to the guy's place. From the very beginning, Marcus behaved extremely nervously and reluctantly let the law enforcement officers into his apartment. During the conversation, the young man admitted that he had indeed seen Stephanie that evening. They had spent it together. Around 1 a.m., they both left the club when Marcus' shift at the DJ console ended. Marcus initially insisted that Stephanie had come to his house after the party and left after about an hour, but the police immediately doubted his truthfulness. After all, they found the missing girl's clutch bag in the guy's apartment, as well as clothes that exactly matched what she was wearing on that fatal night. Suspicions only intensified when suspicious dark red stains were found on the dress. Against this background, Marcus instantly turned into the main suspect, although he continued to insist that Stephanie had left his home safe and sound. According to the young man, Stephanie had spilled wine on her dress, so she asked him for something else to replace it. Of course, it all sounded extremely unconvincing, but the police still lacked sufficient grounds for arrest and charges. So, law enforcement officers sent the missing girl's clothes for examination. The circumstances of what happened to Stephanie remained a mystery, so the detectives relentlessly continued the investigation, focusing mainly on the DJ's personality. However, the case was progressing slowly. Only a month and a half after the girl's disappearance, on September 20, 2002, a random witness turned to the police station. The man recalled that he had stumbled upon something suspicious on the territory of an abandoned farm in the El Arenal area. The detectives immediately went to the scene. It was a large house that had clearly been empty for a long time. However, shortly before that, some strange activity was noticed here. Inside the building, law enforcement officers found human remains. There lay a heavily decomposed female body, dressed in pajamas, underwear, and socks. Due to the terrible condition of the remains, the detectives were initially unable to identify them. But everyone had a suspicion that this was the same Stephanie who was listed as missing and whose search the police were so actively engaged in. It was necessary to carry out a DNA analysis. The results obtained were compared with the genetic material of Stephanie's mother. 
This made it possible to confirm that the body indeed belonged to the 15-year-old schoolgirl from Germany. There was no doubt left, the girl was brutally murdered. Now the detectives faced a new task to find out who could be behind this brutal massacre. The version about the DJ's involvement in the murder could not be proven. Despite Stephanie's things found in his apartment, there was no evidence that the attack on the girl had happened there. The red stain on the dress did indeed turn out to be wine. The friends confirmed Marcus' story about changing clothes. The guy did not lie, but who then could have attacked the young beauty? By that time, Stephanie's family had already returned to Germany. Her brother resumed his studies, and Sylvia went to work. Law enforcement officers decided to check the immediate circle of the deceased more thoroughly. There was every reason to believe that she did return home that night. After all, somehow her camera and bag ended up there. The greatest attention was drawn to Peter Stephanie's mother's boyfriend, who lived in the same house with them. As you know, the man was extremely dissatisfied with the behavior of the rebellious teenager. Stephanie's carefree life greatly troubled her mother, so Peter often lashed out at Stephanie when she was late home or ran away to another party. He was summoned for interrogation at a police station in Germany. At first, Peter categorically refused to admit his involvement in the disappearance and death of the schoolgirl. However, communicating with him helped to turn the investigation in the right direction. After some time, the man shared interesting information. It turned out that in the same period when the family was renting an apartment in Mallorca, they had a neighbor named Torsten. He was a 40-year-old German. Sylvia met him shortly before the children arrived on the island. She agreed to settle him in the apartment secretly from the landlords in order to reduce the total rent. That is why Peter did not tell the police about this earlier, because such rental of real estate was illegal. Stephanie's mother's cohabitant was afraid of problems with the law, but insisted that the tenant seemed to be a decent, calm man from whom no troubles were expected. Now the Spanish police took a closer look at the new person involved in the case. At that time, he lived in the German city of Wuppertal and had a turbulent criminal past. He had previously been convicted of robberies and sexual assaults. But the most shocking thing was that shortly before meeting Stephanie's family, Torsten had escaped from prison and was wanted. He was considered a particularly dangerous criminal. The police of Spain and Germany joined forces, because at that time the suspect had also left Mallorca. As expected, the man could not be found at his place of residence in Germany. Law enforcement officers began to track him down, communicating with local residents, in particular with his neighbors. Pretty quickly, a 50-year-old auto mechanic turned to the police. According to him, in February 2003, Torsten came to him in a white Volkswagen minibus. He asked to install an additional emergency light signaling system above the driver's cab to paint the body in bright colors. In addition, the main suspect wanted to tint the windows with film so that even with bright lighting it would be impossible to see him from the outside. And in the cabin, he planned to remove the seats and arrange a large lying place, similar to a double bed. But the mechanic was most puzzled by a few details. Firstly, he found a receipt for payment for the minibus, which was taken for rent. Secondly, the mechanic stumbled upon an extremely suspicious bag. Inside lay some strange balls, cable ties, several porn magazines, and pills. But at that time, the man did not attach much importance to this and simply carried out the order. He did not see Torsten anymore until his photo was shown on TV. Now the auto mechanic realized that this client was up to something terrifying. The order for the restyling of the minibus and the contents of the bag unambiguously hinted that all this could be connected with the satisfaction of the criminal's perverse sexual fantasies. The rented vehicle was found in a neighboring city. Law enforcement officers also managed to track down Torsten himself, who was immediately arrested and accused of murder. Of course, the man denied his involvement in what happened, only superficially answering questions about the contents of the bag, the alteration of the car, and cohabitation with the victim in an apartment in Mallorca. In the converted minibus, the police found the same bag, which was later dubbed the Rapist's Kit. Torsten could not give satisfactory explanations for these suspicious items that he was carrying with him. Here they found a similar set described by the mechanic, including cable ties, several sex toys, women's underwear, balls with chloroform, sleeping pills, and intimate photos of many girls. 
Also, two bottles of chloroform with Spanish labels and a gun dummy were found in the car. Obviously, this was used to intimidate and lure victims into the car. It became clear that before killing Stephanie, Torsten had bought chloroform at one of the pharmacies. The pharmacist recognized him. When the police contacted the company that rented out cars, it turned out that the minibus was considered stolen. This only reinforced the suspicions about Torsten. Finally, the forensic examination and all the related analyses of Stephanie's body were completed. Toxicological tests showed the presence of chloroform in the victim's body. From the point of view of the prosecutor's office, this was of decisive importance, since now the investigation could directly link Torsten to the crime. Presumably, with the help of a dummy gun, he lured Stephanie out of the house. It is assumed that after that, the killer used chloroform to put Stephanie to sleep and deal with her without hindrance. This is a powerful sedative that is often used to put people to sleep, including by rapists. The substance remains in the body after inhalation, but not for long, only if the victim survives. According to experts, Stephanie died from inhaling an excessive amount of chloroform and was poisoned. In addition to the bag with a set of dubious items, during the inspection of the car, another woman's handbag was found. Inside were documents and personal belongings. The detectives even managed to find its owner. It turned out to be an 18-year-old girl who was lucky enough to survive after meeting the criminal. The victim said that she accidentally met Torsten in a parking lot. She just greeted this man and went on, and then came to her senses inside an unfamiliar van. Judging by her words, she was also put to sleep with chloroform, with the only difference that she did not have an overdose so she survived. Fortunately, the girl was able to identify the attacker. According to her, she did not receive any injuries. She managed to escape as soon as she regained consciousness after the effects of chloroform. At that moment, Torsten was not in the cabin. The girl ran out through the unlocked rear doors of the car and hid. Now Torsten was also charged with raping this girl. He continued to deny everything. After the discovery of Stephanie's body on the abandoned farm, the forensic expert carefully examined it, and the criminologists examined the place where it was found. They managed to find evidence that the criminal had lived next to the decomposed remains for over a month. This was also confirmed by specially trained dogs that unerringly recognized Torsten's scent. Despite the obvious evidence, the man continued to deny everything and refused to admit guilt. To talk to the suspect, one of the investigators volunteered to work undercover. He ended up in the same cell with Torsten in prison and quickly found common ground with him. The policeman did manage to get a partial confession. The conversation was recorded on tape. Torsten said that he had killed Stephanie, but considered it an accident. According to him, after the girl returned from the party, he met her in the apartment. The rapist had had his eye on her for a long time and was waiting for the right opportunity to take advantage of it. That night, the appropriate moment came. Stephanie was tipsy, her family was asleep, so he decided to take a chance. The man began to pester Stephanie, and she began to resist. An argument broke out between them. Torsten did not describe all the details, but noted that it was Stephanie who attacked him first. Allegedly, he simply pushed the girl away but did not calculate his strength. She hit her head and lost consciousness. Interestingly, he never mentioned the chloroform found in her body. Torsten panicked. He immediately took the girl's body from the apartment and took it to the territory of the abandoned farm. Here the man lived next to the corpse, afraid of being exposed, until he decided to flee to Germany. Torsten's story sounded implausible, since no head injuries were found on the victim. This meant that he had lied about the cause of death. In general, it was surprising that the relatives of the deceased did not immediately suspect the neighbor who disappeared at the same moment when Stephanie vanished. In August 2006, four years after the murder, the prosecutor's office finally charged Torsten with assault with fatal consequences. For this crime, he faced a maximum sentence of 10 years in prison. The prosecution insisted on the most severe sentence. The lawyer argued that Torsten's confession was obtained by deception, so the recording could not be used to press charges. In addition, according to the defense attorney, Stephanie's body was accidentally contaminated with chloroform after death, 
Although this version sounded absurd, now it had to be refuted. All this required additional research. Since then, it has been possible to rule out the accidental nature. According to criminologists, the chloroform content in the blood was too high for an accident. It was believed that the criminal had deliberately poisoned the schoolgirl so that she would not turn him in to the police. The prosecutor's office also believed that Torsten's confession was obtained lawfully, and this was enough to press charges. Psychiatric examinations were conducted, and the defendant was diagnosed with an antisocial personality disorder and pronounced narcissistic character traits. The lawyer insisted on leniency since Torsten had had a difficult childhood. Shortly after his birth, his parents divorced. Childhood was spent in a dysfunctional environment. Several cruel stepfathers were changed. In the end, his mother also abandoned him. A series of foster families began. Because of this, he moved a lot, often changed schools, and therefore could not build long-term relationships with anyone in his entire life. Torsten had no people who considered themselves close to him, no friends. His biological mother periodically appeared in the boy's life and then disappeared again. According to the lawyer, all this shook Torsten's psyche from an early age. He simply did not know what kindness, love, and parental care were, and this largely influenced the formation of an antisocial personality structure. It was difficult for him to fit into new collectives, so there were always problems with other children at school. He was often bullied, and all this ended in constant conflicts. After the first hearings, 44-year-old Torsten was sentenced to 10 years in prison, the maximum possible term. The defendant and his lawyer did not agree with this decision. The defense attorney continued the fight, and he managed to get a review of the case. The judge decided that the accused confession, made in an illegal way, would not be used as evidence. Despite this, the rapist and murderer was still convicted, only now to 11 years in prison. The jury concluded that he was guilty of an intentional assault that led to the girl's death. Plus one year was added for concealing evidence. With the help of court evidence, the prosecutor's office managed to convince that the military man was waiting for the victim in the apartment. She returned and even changed into her pajamas to go to bed. But then he attacked her, raped her, and then killed her to hide the traces of the crime. Wishing to preserve the victim's body, the military man took her to a farm located nearby. Here Torsten lived next to the body for over a month, afraid of being exposed. At the same time, he actively participated in all search operations, was involved in almost all raids, and also provided powerful support to the missing girl's family. Of course, all this was done in order to deflect suspicion from himself. Until the moment of the criminal's detention, Stephanie's family did not know that they had let a person who had escaped from prison in another country into their apartment. He was accused of several robberies, as well as an attack on another girl on sexual grounds, which was also carried out with the help of chloroform. In prison, Torsten was an exemplary prisoner, he was even an assistant to a priest. For another attack, he generally received a suspended sentence. He served his sentence and was released after 11 years. Stephanie's family insisted on a harsher sentence and was disappointed with such a mild punishment. A similar position was taken by the police in Spain and Germany who participated in the joint investigation. They believed that Torsten was a ticking time bomb. The incident that happened to Stephanie as well as with the girls who survived a similar attack, was only a matter of time. He would attack girls again, rape and kill them. It is clear that Torsten still lives in Germany. It is unclear exactly where and under what name. His photographs are hidden. He has not appeared in criminal episodes anymore, at least not yet. So, this chilling story about the brutal murder of 15-year-old Stephanie Rugberg is a vivid example of how carelessness and credulity can lead to fatal consequences. The girl became a victim of an insidious maniac who took advantage of the hospitality of her family and staged a terrible massacre on a defenseless teenager. This tragedy was a real test for Stephanie's relatives, especially for her mother Sylvia, who never forgave herself for letting a dangerous criminal into the house. However, thanks to her perseverance and the professionalism of the police from Spain and Germany, who worked tirelessly on the investigation, it was possible to expose the real culprit and bring him to justice. Although many believe that Torsten received too mild a punishment for his terrible crime, justice still prevailed. 
Although this will not bring Stephanie back to life, at least her family can feel some relief knowing that the murderer of their daughter and sister has been punished. This story is a warning to all of us. You need to be extremely careful and cautious, especially when it comes to the safety of our children. Do not trust unfamiliar people, even if they seem nice and friendly. Behind an attractive mask, a real monster can hide, ready to ruin lives and break hearts. If you are interested in this detective story and want to learn more details about high-profile crimes and their investigation, be sure to subscribe to the channel Detective Brooks. Here you will find many exciting and dramatic stories that will make you empathize with the victims, admire the ingenuity of the investigators, and believe in the inevitability of punishment for criminals. Join our community of detective genre fans and uncover the secrets of the most high-profile criminal cases together with Detective Brooks.